Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. We're glad to have you all at our fourth in the series of the Wednesday webinar series for trauma-informed care. Today, we will be presenting care plans and trauma-informed care in the long-term care system. If I can get my slide to advance. There we go. Oh, whoa, it went all the way to the end. Sorry about that. What is it doing? I have no idea. See, that's that technology going on again, people. Okay, the webinar is being recorded. It is available to watch for CEUs. For everything right now, we're waiting on um, approval from activity directors. Right now, we have nursing administrators and social work, and we're hoping to hear back about activity directors today. Um, the recording will also be available to watch for CEUs until August 17th of 2023. Again, you don't have video or audio access, but you can ask any questions in the chat. If you have registered, but you are online with someone else, if you're in a group, in a room or whatever, put your names or have the person running the computer put your names in the chat so I don't miss anyone because Zoom will not record you if you're not signed on how you're um, registered. So you don't need to do it if you're signed on the same way you registered, but if you're in a room with somebody else or signed on by phone, please put your name in the uh, chat so I can make sure that I don't leave you out. There will be access again to the webinar recording and the PowerPoints that we're using today, and I will send those out later this week, first of next, next week at the latest. At the end, there will be a evaluation that pops up. Please take care of that for us because it's invaluable feedback that has helped us improve each of these each month we do them. Uh, and that's all I got for that. Now, Suzanne will introduce Dorothy. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce three fantastic West Virginia long-term care experts uh, that we'll, we're happy to learn from today. Um, we'll hear first from Dorothy Frazier, and Dorothy's been in long-term care for 16 years as a social worker liaison, educator, and executive director, and she's assisted with policy development and implementation, as well as training staff in a multitude of program direct directives. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dorothy, and then I'll introduce the other two when they pop up. Thank you, Suzanne. And let me go ahead and apologize. I've already got a little flag on my computer. It says my internet is unstable, so I may lose you throughout this. I'm sorry. Um, what I'm presenting is are the tags related to trauma-informed care and how they relate to assessments and care plans. Oh, there they come. You want to go to the next one for me, Susan? Eventually. <laughs> it hates me today. There we go. At least you have internet. <laughs> the main tag that uh, is the most concerning is F699. That is your quality of care tag. And the trauma-informed care falls under that. F-659, Comprehensive Care Plans and Qualified Persons, F-741, Sufficient Competent Staff Behavioral Health Needs, and F-949, Behavioral Health Training, are additional tags that you can see with any type of trauma-informed care. So on the next slide is F-699. And the facility must ensure that residents who are trauma survivors receive culturally competent trauma-informed care in accordance with professional standards of practice in the county for residents. I wanted to make sure I stress that because a lot of care plans are canned. And with trauma-informed care, they can't be. They have to be resident-centered. So you have to do those assessments right off the bat to determine where you're going to go with that care plan. We'll get to the next one for me. The assessment is under 699 as well. And I know different facilities use different assessments and different approaches to do that social history. The main thing with this part is the assessment has to be ongoing. It is not a one and done assessment and you move on with changes in the resident's condition or new behaviors or triggers, you have to update that assessment and that care plan. Trauma, resident, Residents in long-term care facilities may include but are not limited to trauma survivors, such as military veterans, survivors of large-scale natural and human 
caused disasters, Holocaust survivors, and survivors of physical, sexual, or mental abuse, or any other violent crime. Um, we have noticed that COVID should be added to that list. We have a lot of residents, if you have to lock the door or they have to be quarantined for another illness, it's become traumatic for them. Want to go to the next one? The facilities themselves have to be careful about re traumatization of residents. Um, that can be done at admission, just the, the fact that they're going to a nursing home can be traumatic or we can inadvertently trigger a traumatic event or a recall. So we try, at least in our facility, to get as much information prior to admission to avoid that and go ahead and train the staff. And you know, this is the concern that we're gonna have with this patient. This is how we need to address it. Or if it's a someone of a different culture, we'll try to find out as much about that culture as possible and the best source of that is the family. They can sit down with you and make that care plan. They can discuss triggers. Um, triggers can include loud noises, bright flashing lights. Maybe this person had autism. Um, maybe they were in a fire. You know, there's multiple different things that could be the cause of that. The assessment and the care plan should pull that out for you. You want to get to the next one for me? Culture, as mentioned in the background section, the demographics of nursing homes have changed. The ethnicity, diversity, uh, racial, sexual orientation, gender identity, and ages in the nursing home are all different now. And we have to be able to accommodate those and do that in a very professional, cultural, competent manner. We can use the facility assessment to identify resident populations that are unique and with cultural characteristics that we need to address. So in, in rural Wayne, there's not a whole lot of diversity, but in the other bigger buildings that I have been in, there's quite a few <coughs> that we need to address those characteristics. And we can do that with, again, the assessment and care planning. We can develop competencies within the facility to help staff to communicate effectively with residents. Um, we can talk with interpreters if we need to, or get some information about the family and their culture and include that in the care plan and every day living of that resident. F656 and F659, they kind of go together. So that care plan has to address a traumatic event. And I get asked a lot of times, what if the person doesn't want that specifically in their care plan? You don't have to be sp specific. You can care plan the triggers. You can care plan behaviors without wording that traumatic event and upsetting the resident because it is their care plan, it is not ours. Uh, trigger specific interventions should identify ways to decrease the resident exposure to triggers and re traumatization the resident, as well as identify ways to mitigate or decrease the effect of the trigger on the resident. <laughs> Most of the interventions in care plans are, are very canned, so they'll have to be tweaked or updated to meet that resident's needs. Uh, care planning to address cultural preferences. When a facility admits a resident is determined that it can provide the individualized care and services that residents require. That is what we promise those families and patients. We are gonna be able to meet their needs. And to do that, part of it is cultural preferences. You know, they have specific foods or religious ceremonies or do they have a custom? And we need to incorporate that in the assessment and care plan and make sure as a facility that we are meeting those needs as well. A lot of people are not aware of the impact a culture or their cultural preferences can have on a patient and a patient's care. It could be the reason why they're refusing a treatment or a medication. If we can adjust to meet that, it may not be a behavior for that resident. You want to go to the next one for me? 
comprehensive resident centered care plans regulatory group. This is the part of care planning that makes sure that care plan is very comprehensive. It identifies that patient and is individualized. But we also have to have the staff qualified and trained to meet those interventions that we put in the care plan. So just documenting the care plan is only part of the, of the process. We have to break down and train our staff, document that we trained them, let them ask questions. And again, that's ongoing. It's not a one and done deal. You're going to get different scenarios, different, um, I don't want to say problems, but there'll be, you'll run into different things with this and that has to be transferred over to the staff. Non-compliance with this regulation creates a situ situation where a resident is at risk for more than minimum harm. So this one will not be tagged at a low level. F741, this is the competency and sufficient staff for behavioral health needs. In long-term care, that is a hard goal for us to, to meet. Most of us don't have psychiatrists or psychologists on staff um, and doing contracts with outside facilities sometimes is very hard to do, especially if you're in a rural county where those type of programs don't exist and then you have to factor in transportation. This tag, in order to meet it, we have to train our staff to reach out to behavioral health when we need it and make sure that we get those contacts and meetings for our patients. Um, some social workers probably have a lot of background in this and can intervene, but unless they're a, a certified mental health professional, we still need to seek that assistance. Okay. You wanna to get to the next one for me? F949, it requires the facility to develop, implement, maintain an effective behavioral health training program for all staff. Part of this training program has to be self-care. We can teach our staff how to take care of the residents, watch for triggers, care plan, but our staff have to be able to be taught how to take care of themselves or it, it becomes mundane and it's every day and it doesn't play the importance in their lives that it should. Um, Implementing non-pharmacological individualized approaches to care. That's very, very important too. We can't medicate for everything. There, there are non-farms we can use. Redirection, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, if the resident wants to go for a walk, go outside, has a special relationship with the staff, encourage that. The more non-farms that you use, the better for the patient. Um, your activities can be geared towards trauma-informed. Uh, if we know that specific triggers are for a patient, we may not wanna have that activity in that section of the building where that patient's at, or we may wanna offer a different activity for that resident, even if it's one-on-one. -on -one. Encourage meaningful relationships with residents. Your staff are, are their family. They're with their staff more than anybody else to let them and encourage them to have those relationships. Um, make sure that your atmosphere is conducive to the mental health and psychosocial well-being of residents. Can I go to the next one for me? The last slide I have are some of the roadblocks to trauma-informed care, and this by no way is a comprehensive list. Poor social histories is the top. If we don't know what we have to deal with by doing an accurate social history, it makes our jobs much harder. And most of the time it translates into the resident has behaviors, not, not the trauma-informed care interventions that we need. Uh, lack of autonomy, education and training for staff, change in environment, the cost associated with the education and training and ongoing training, COVID and quarantine, 
lack of trust, cultural differences, self biases. We project what we feel onto the other residents or staff, and that's not acceptable. And a lack of support. That's all I have, Susan. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Yes, does anybody have any questions for Dorothy? She's got something else going on, so she's going to have to hop off in a minute. So if you have any questions for Dorothy, feel free to put those in the chat. If we get any later, I can send to her by email and get answers for everyone. Everybody's just typing their name right now, Jessica. Uh, I said Jessica because she was the last one to type her name. It's like a second Monday to me. So, all right, Dorothy, we appreciate you. We appreciate the information you've given. And if I get any other questions along the lines of your presentation, I will send those to you by email and we'll get those out to everyone else. Thank you. Thanks, Dorothy. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, and before we move on, I, I did just want to respond earlier. We had a question from somebody about uh, whether this presentation applied to assisted living. And if you listen to Dorothy's part, you might be a little worried uh, because... <laughs> The nursing home uh, tags that Dorothy went through do just apply to nursing homes, but the concepts of assessment and care planning really translate well to assisted living. Certainly, I, th I think we use different language. Um, you might call it a functional needs assessment or a service plan, but the concepts that Pam and Cindy are going to talk about will really translate well to assisted living and will empower you to meet the needs of your residents uh, maybe in a better way than you have been. So I hope you all hang in there with us and didn't get too discouraged by going through nursing home regulations. We promise uh, it, it'll be more applicable as, as you hang in. Uh, so with that, I'm really pleased to introduce Pam Matter. Uh, as an RN, Pam has worked in long-term care since 1991 with experience in the roles of MDS coordination, director of education, and director of nursing, among others. She obtained her gerontological cert cert certification through ANCC in 1998 and her BSN through WVU in 2014. She was a project coordinator for the state's QIO for 10 years and currently is the director of regulatory clinical services with the West Virginia Healthcare Association. Cindy Wadling, MSN RN QCP, is a seasoned clinical operations nursing professional with an extensive background in healthcare to acute care, case management, regulatory compliance, clinical operations, Director of Nursing Management Experience with an emphasis on quality assurance and performance improvements and mentorship. Cindy's passion is ensuring that our vulnerable population receive the care and services that they so deserve to promote each person's quality of life. Welcome, Pam and Cindy. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, and hope that Susan's gremlins did not come over to me. Oh, now they're my gremlins. Okay. <laughs> Who else's would they be? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Enable editing. Shared stopped for some reason. Let's try this again. Share slideshow from the beginning. Can you see my screen? Yes, but we can also see the second one. Let me see yeah. if I can get, how about that? Still there, yeah. Still the same one. No, it, it switched, it's good now. Oh, it switched? Yeah. Ugh, look at me. <laughs> Okay, well, I would like to welcome everybody to our section of the of the training. This trauma-informed training has been absolutely fantastical. I've appreciated every single session that we've had so far, and I look forward to the ones that are coming. So um, what, what Dorothy talked about is so very important as far as making things individualized and doing the uh, care plans and resident assessments, but sometimes it's not very clear 
what we need to care plan. What's going on with that resident? Why are they having these behaviors? Or what are they trying to communicate to us when they're doing these things? And there are so many resources out there that you can utilize in order to find out what's going on. What are the triggers? What's, what's the situation involved in uh, this resident? Um, do you always find them? Absolutely not. You will sometimes there are things that are going on. You will never determine the reasoning behind or the root cause of some of these communication barriers and some of these behaviors and things that are going on. But we've got to give it a try. And there are some really good um, tools out there that you guys can utilize. And they're simple. They're not, when I first started going through, we used to go through um, uh, what was called, um, oh my gosh, total, I can't even remember. It was so many years ago. But there was so many documents that we would utilize in order to use as resources. So what we've got to do is cut these down to where they're simplified, they're easy to use, and they're productive. We don't want to just use tools because they're a tool and we want to put it in our QAPI manual or we want to put it in a book to show the surveyors, look what we did. No, we want these things to be effective. So what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at getting to the root of these problems. Um, it's called root cause analysis. And again, in the essence of time, I cannot go over all of the tools that there are. I'm going to hit one specific, the one that has been most helpful to me in my entire career. Um, and you can, there's, you can use this for trauma-informed care, for behaviors. You can use it to just solve an issue that you're having with your residents or your staff or anything like that. So, this root, root cause analysis is the basis of what I what we like to call spaghetti approach versus the scientific approach. We want to do the scientific approach because it's the it's the best way to get to the true answer. The spaghetti approach means those of you who are Italian, who are out there cookers or chefs or whatever, how do you check to see if spaghetti's done? And I'm sure you guys are screaming it at the at the at the screen, but I'll just go ahead and tell you: you take that spaghetti and you throw it against the wall. If it sticks, it's done. If it slides off, it's not done. So that's kind of what we do when we're guessing the approaches to some of these problems. Um, we like to say, okay, uh, this person's falling. So our first thing we need to do is put a restraint on them, you know, or that's old school. That's what they used to do. Now we have to think of all of the different reasons why this person could be falling. And we come up with those rationales and we come up with solutions to each one of those. And then we try the ones that are easy fixes. That's the scientific approach. The spaghetti approach is just guessing and trying to figure out what's going on and throwing that approach against the resident to hope it sticks. So I was gonna say next slide, but that would be me. Um, root cause analysis is, is very important when, um, for example, um, if you're wanting to get to the bottom, how do you get rid of a weed? What would happen if you just cut it off? They grow back because the roots have not been removed. The root cause analysis is what we're going for. Removing those roots, getting rid of that problem, or at least addressing it to where the resident can, can get past that or they can really communicate what the issue is. Okay, in order to start the process, um, one of the most important things with care planning and with taking care of our residents and making sure things are individualized is getting to the bedside. Um, when, when you're around a table trying with your interdisciplinary team talking about a resident, um, first of all, if that resident is not in that room, then there's an issue. If you, or if you don't bring them, don't bring them to the room if they won't come to the room, go to their bedside. There are so many answers to questions if you go to the bedside and try to solve these problems. 
Um, there's an example that we have that one of our um, nursing assistants, many, many, many years ago, we had a resident who would not turn and she was um, developing major pressure ulcers because she refused her wounds. And we went to the bedside and we tried to get her to turn and tried to do all this stuff. When her nursing assistant, who was her nursing assistant for a very long time, come over and said, what are y'all doing? You know, and we're like, well, we're trying to get her to turn over and she won't turn over. And he was like, watch this. And he took her television, rolled it over to her side, the, the side of the bed, and he turned her so she could watch. That was the thing. She wasn't wanting to miss her stories so or her television. So if she, when he wanted to give her care, he would just simply move her television and she would allow them then to turn her and give her care. So something that simple, you would not have known had you not went to the bedside, had you not talked to the care, caregivers. Those are the people who know these secrets. And if you're not involving them, you're missing a huge chance. Also involving the resident's family, their friends, their visitors, and most importantly, like we just talked about, the resident. All right. Sometimes it seems like we're trying to pull a donkey to water, but it's very important for us to give it a try. We have to, we have to consistently attempt to find out the problem so we can come up with a solution. Now, you want to link your solutions to root causes. And one of the things that we used to do, and I, I will admit, I thought it was stupid at first. And for example, we if there was a problem with med passes, we would, what this systemic action um, system, the scientific system says, is to flow chart what, what the steps are. No matter how simple it is, flow chart those steps. And then you look at each step and you come up with problems that could occur at each one of those steps. And then you look at those problems and you come up, you pick one and you come up with solutions associated with that, those problems. Pick the easiest fix and that's the one that you do. And then if that doesn't help, you move on to the next one. That is a systematic approach to take, trying to find the root cause. Um, when you're developing solutions, there's, there's three categories, weak, intermediate, and strong. Weak solutions require people to remember things. And this is what we always did. We will educate on the proper med pass, or we will educate on proper um, you know, hand washing techniques. We will educate on not throwing linen in the floor. There's so many things, that's all, that's a lot of what our 2567s would say, is we're educating on, which is a weak solution because it requires humans remembering and humans are fallible as we know, and it's a very weak solution. Intermediate solution somewhat depends on humans, but we give them tools to help them. So it's that's the, um, that's the medium range solutions, but the strong solutions is redesigning the process. If you're having a situation with, um, with, uh, folks throwing linen in the floor. Why? Why are they doing that? Why are you throwing linen in the floor? What's the situation? We could educate them and tell them, don't throw linen in the floor. Or we can come up with some redesigned processes. Look at the environment. Look at the situations. How can we prevent that from happening and making it easier? easier? Those are the strong solutions. And all of this can be transformed into tra trauma-informed care. All of these things, anything that you're doing to help the resident with these triggers, you know, you want to come up with strong solutions in order so it won't happen anymore for the resident. All right, we're going to do a couple of scenarios. Um, the first scenario is Mrs. Smith. She wanders at night and... Um, as Dorothy mentioned before, used to be they wandered at night, we'd give them sleeping medicine, correct? Or we'd put them on something because by golly, they should be in that bed sleeping at nighttime, right? So, and we know now that's not the case. 
um, she, but she does wander at night and re redirection has not helped. Um, it's increasing her risk, risk of falls because she's not sleeping. She's not sleeping in 24 hours. I mean, she'll, she'll just continue. I'm sure you guys have had those residents that just wander until they absolutely drop. So we got to come up with a solution to find out why is she not sleeping at night? There are the, my, the one tool that I'm going to go into depth here today with is the five magic questions. And that sounds all kind of spectacular and stuff, but basically it's the senses, your five senses. How are we going to use that? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to gather, you're going to get your interdisciplinary team. That includes your residents, your families, your visitors, your what, whoever you can pull in. And you want to ask these questions. Back when everything was her norm, with her norm, what did she see when she went to bed? What was her, what was her norm? What did made her sleep? Um, was it complete darkness? Did she use a nightlight? Um, did she have a window in her room with lights on outside? Did she use a face mask? Did she leave the TV on? Or base, or it could say, oh, mom was a midnight nurse. She didn't sleep at night. She slept during the day for 35 years. So, you know, you can, you can get a lot of answers with what did she see when she went to bed. And we're going to talk about solutions in a minute. What did she smell when she went to bed? Was there a certain fabric softener she loved? Um, how about her husband's cologne or her uh, partner's lotion or whatever? What was her, what was the smell? Um, was there certain medications that she would utilize? Vapor rub, my gosh, my grandma, that was all, every time she'd go to bed, she'd put Vicks Vapor Rub on her chest in or, and go to bed. So what did she smell? Um, and then the, the husband's cologne, there was a situation before where this facility, I don't, I've tried and tried to remember what facility it is, but they had a resident who wouldn't sleep. She wouldn't wander constantly. They, her husband had died just like a month or two before. They found out that her husband used some cologne and they got her a body pillow and put it in the bed with her with that cologne. And that worked. It 100% worked. So, you know, smell is an important sense that we need to look at. Now, what did she taste before she went to bed? First one, cigarette, because I know that's something that smokers do. The right before they go to bed, they smoke that last cigarette and then they're off to dreamland. Um, how about chamomile tea? That relaxes a lot of people. And sometimes that's, you know, toothpaste, brushing her teeth before she goes to bed. A certain bedtime snack that she always had. My grandparents always had Neapolitan ice cream and um, rich crackers before they went to bed. So, you know, what did she taste before she went to bed? The next one is what did she hear before she went to bed? Did she have a fan on? How many of you guys can't sleep without a fan? Um, did she have on rain noises, white noises? Was there a lot of snoring? Some people have dogs, pugs especially, or bulldogs that snore like crazy in the bed with them and they can't sleep without that sound. Um, again, the TV or the radio, what did she hear when she slept at home or slept well? And then of course, what did she feel? Did she always lotion herself? Had, did she have flannel sheets, a weighted blanket? Again, the fan or the window open or again, someone next to her. What did she feel? Now, her results, what they did, and I'm going to take it off of that. What they did is with Mrs. Smith is they went through all of these and they determined what is the easiest fix? What is the easiest fix for, for one of these results, for these results? For what she saw, they told her that they that this resident had an emergency phone by her bed at home that glowed red. It had it was a red button that was just that she could push and get a hold of her family if it was um, an emergency. They did that. That they, they thought it was a pretty easy fix. Absolutely no help. Um, what she smelled again. They thought about the body pillow with the old spice but they were thinking that it would be a hazard for this particular resident. So they decided not to do that one first. What she tasted, 
She always had chamomile tea before she went to bed. They attempted this. And what they did was they made the chamomile tea, took her to the bedroom, let her sit on the edge of the bed. She sipped her tea and she laid down. And it what they didn't have to force her into the bed. The chamomile tea triggered her from past that she went to bed after that. And then, of course, they did what she heard. And the big thing for her was she always slept with rain noises. She, they got her a rain machine. Um, the noises within the facility would keep her up. But that rain machine beside her bed had her, they got her in the bed with the chamomile. But the second intervention was they had got her a rain machine and it worked for her to go to bed, go to sleep for most of the rest of the night. At least she got, she got the amount of sleep she needed. Okay. So the next scenario is Mr. Thomas, and I want to hurry because I don't want to take up Cindy's time. Um, Mr. Thomas was constantly yelling, I want my coffee every morning. I want my coffee. How many of you guys would be yelling like that? I want my coffee. Um, but the problem was they provided him coffee and he would throw it at the people. He would throw it at the staff. They began uh, the spaghetti approach by just changing his coffee, you know, sugar, cream, you know, other stuff to make their, they didn't, first they didn't reach out to the family. They asked the resident, but he wasn't able to tell them. All he would say was, I want my coffee. So they, then they decided to go into the, the five senses, the interviews um, with the resident himself and his daughter. What did morning, what, what did morning coffee uh, what at morning coffee did your dad or you like to see? And his daughter told him that he had a Green Bay Packers mug he used every morning. That was the only mug he'd use and he would drink his coffee. What did your dad and or what did you hear? She said he always had the morning news on when he drank his coffee. Smell, again, fresh brewed coffee. He loved his coffee and he loved it black. And what did he taste? Absolutely no breakfast. He only drank coffee. I don't understand what's going on, the daughter would say. And then they asked feel. And she said, oh, she would love, he loved the sunshine. He would love to sit out on the back porch in the sunshine with his coffee. And then she went, oh. and she remembered his pet and best friend was named Coffee. That was his snouser. So they decided that would be the first approach they would try. So they got one of those stuffed animal dogs, gave it to Mr. Thomas every morning with his morning black coffee. And of course they had to get the Green Bay Packers mug, but um, it worked. That was the issue. It wasn't anything to do with coffee coffee. It had to do with this baby and his and which is trauma, losing your animals when you go into long-term care or when losing animals, period. That is a true trauma. And we would never have known about coffee unless we had done this type of, of um, interventions and, and assessments. So that's mine. I'm going to turn this over to my friend and colleague, Little Miss, um, Little Miss, uh, Cindy, it's Cindy. I know, I'm trying to find my, I'm trying to find my camera. <laughs> okay. I'm I have with. so enjoyed Dorothy and Pam, and, I, and I've already started my care plan, by the way, my, my personal care plan when I come to you. So just be aware, I've got some good ideas and I'm ready to roll. Uh, and I see, hi, Sandra Mead. I was so glad to see you pop on. Um, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. And I'm going to talk about the six guiding principles to a trauma informed approach and it's really regardless of the cognitive status and we know that with our referral sources in 2023 already believe it or not that we see a variety um, of referrals come to our centers and we need to be aware of their basic needs as always but we also need to be aware of their backgrounds what they need where they come from and how we can approach um, these folks as individuals uh, versus a group. And I really liked what Dorothy said in her presentation. You cannot create a one-size-fits-all trauma-informed care plan. 
uh, for any one of us on this call or for anyone we bring into one of our centers, be it assisted living or skilled nursing, because we're all such unique individuals. We were intended to be that way and we are. And even though we may have comparable um, events that happen in our lives, we still do deal with them very individually. So and into what Pam said, it's so, so important to include that person and not talk around them. And again, that's regardless whether they are cognitively intact or whether they have a cognitive impairment, that person is really the center of all of your approaches. So next slide, please, Pam, and thank you for uh, doing the slides. So I wanted to get out of the box a little bit. I, I read um, CMS and regulatory compliance all day long, most days. And I thought, well, what, what is everybody else doing? There's so much. And, and like um, many of you, I'm sure, myself included, um, I have family members that, that have substance abuse issues that may well be a referral someday. Uh, they're not 60 years or above. Actually, they're below 40 at this point in life. So how do we take an all-inclusive approach to the way we guide our trauma-informed um, treatment or, or person-centered care. So you look at safety. Safety is many things to many people. Um, when I think safety, I think I, I have a roof over my head. Um, I have food to eat. Um, I have friends and people that care about me. And we all need that safety at a level that meets our needs. Um, and this is from SHAMSHA and CDC, they develop these guidelines. So trustworthiness and transparency, it's almost easier to discuss what breaks trustworthiness and transparency than it is to go into the details of, of those two things because we all know that once we feel misled or once we feel left out or once we feel that plans regarding us have been made without us, we lose that measure of trust that we have in people um, that should be intrinsic in the relationships that we have with each other and in the relationships that we have uh, with, with our residents, with our patients. Peer support. So uh, Sandra said hello to me early on, and I just have to give a shout out to uh, the social workers I work with at Stonerise who really taught me so much um, about my lack of knowledge of the social work assessment. So I want to say how important it is um, for all of us to, as soon as that assessment's done, get in there, see those, that's really going to tell you who that person was, what they did in life, what were their passions, what were their dislikes. And with the trauma-informed care um, portion, it's not something that we just all pop up in morning meeting and say, oh, well, let's talk about this section of the, of the evaluation or the assessment, whatever your organization calls it. Um, but there can be, so thank you, Sandra, let me, let me circle back around to say that. Uh, and I learned a lot and I appreciate that. So with peer support, yes, uh, you know, we can develop groups internally um, amongst the population that can support each other. And again, that's individuality. Do they want to? Do they have a desire to? Is there a coffee club for us coffee drinkers? You know, people who have things in common tend to want to get together over a commonality and enjoy that time. So, so do we have those peer support groups? Um, the really uncomfortable things that, that we don't like to talk about is grief, loss, things that pain us individually. But again, you're in a circumstance where you would be surprised how many people have a, a, a related event that can comfort one another in peer support groups. And I can't stress enough how much it is to include that person in a discussion as to whether they would be interested or not. Some may be, some may not be. Collaboration and mutuality, we all want that. Again, that goes back to include the person. Um, empowerment and choice. I can't imagine, and uh, you know, Pam referenced, uh, you know, leaving your home, giving up your pets, giving up your independence, and what that does. We need to be able to ensure as much choice and as much empowerment for the individual as we possibly can, regardless of their circumstances, and again, regardless of their cognitive status. That's crucial to all of us. I can't imagine um, waking up tomorrow morning and Pam saying, here, Cindy, is your breakfast. Now, if it's before eight o'clock, she won't be received well in my room at all. That's part of my care plan already. So keep that in mind when we approach people and how we approach them and set up the care. Also, cultural, historic, and gender issues. Um, I think I think Dorothy referenced from, she's, she's uh in Wayne County currently, and, and I'm a girl from Mason County, West Virginia, born and bred. 
Um, it, you know, there are times where we ask questions to get answers and identify the need of the individual, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's the approach um, that that we need to be sensitive to, and um, sometimes I'm just very transparent in the way I ask a question and just admit to my own, um, if you'll excuse this term, my own ignorance to another culture or other gender issues that are, are out and about. Um, and I want to be respectful when I ask these questions. When I think of historical, I see um, the closer I get to 60, the more sensitive I am to ageism. I've always um, um, felt that I've been very respectful, but it's amazing uh, in interactions with different people how disrespectful the general population, and I'll, I'll give an example, can be um, to someone over, let's say, 30. Um, now, my mother is a lovely lady. She's extremely intelligent, and she's 85 years old. Uh, she's very articulate. She knows her mind, and she'll share it with you. You don't have to ask. But one of the things that happens with her, and this is attached to historical, is people talk over her, not to her. And she has a magnificent story to tell, a history that could um, really contribute to how one would perceive her in her day-to-day -day actions. Um, so these are cultural, these guiding principles I really like from a perspective of you can apply these not only to residents, but you can also apply this to your staff and to your leadership and all team members in your center, because this is essentially something that we all deserve, that we all um crave in life is just the feeling to be encompassed and comforted by mutual respect and trust. So if you go to the next, Pam. Pam, you've got the clicker. There we go. So digging deeper, going back just a little bit to regulatory compliance. This is the expectation of CMS. And, and I really think the team on here um, wants this and more for their resident population. Um, again, whether you're in an AL or whether you're in a SNF. So the facility must ensure that residents who are trauma survivors receive culturally competent trauma-informed care in accordance with professional standards of practice and accounting for residents' experiences and preferences in order to eliminate or mitigate triggers that may cause re-traumatization of the, the resident. And the point was made earlier, that can be very difficult to do. That really depends on the person's social history, how much they care to share or not share um, <clears throat> with you as an interdisciplinary team. And next, Pam. So trauma-informed care, according to the CDC, is adopting a trauma-informed approach is not accomplished, or they state that adopting a tra trauma-informed approach is not accomplished through any single particular technique or checklist. It requires constant attention, caring awareness, sensitivity, and possibly a cultural change at the organizational level. So I think it's really important here to reflect on what is the culture? Um, what is the culture in your building? What is the culture of um, the surroundings in the building? Is it calming? Is it um, something that you would want in your very own home? Um, is there respect among all staff in the center? Is this something that your residents can plainly see, that staff are respectful of one another, they're respectful of the residents, they're respectful in the interactions they have? I think one of my triggers uh, is when I go someplace to eat or I'm at um, a store and I see um, someone I would assume would be in a leadership position being very demeaning uh, or correcting someone. That ruins my experience. That ruins my experience at the time. So imagine if I'm entrusting you with my care in your culture, in your building, and I experienced this once, I've lost trust because it triggers something in me that I don't find to be acceptable behavior. And I have very little control over that behavior. That control is in your hands, not in the hands of your residents. So I would suggest that everybody really dig deep and take a look at are we truly, um, we all speak the words. We all, know the, we all know the trigger words. We all know to speak the words. But are we really living the words when we're in our residence environments? And that's something to consider. Pam, next. 
So, you know, the trauma, to define a trauma, it is results from an event, a series of events or set of circumstances. Trauma is physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. Trauma has lasting adverse effect on individuals functioning, their mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Next, Pam. So the care. We've talked about the care, the different ways um, that we can assess, evaluate, review the requirements to determine what is the approach to deliver the care. And I think we've all echoed that it is individualized. There is not a cookie cutter, one size fits all. What must happen in order to prevent re-triggering a trauma uh, is to understand, recognize, and respond, respond to the effects of all types of trauma. Um, recognizing the widespread impact and signs and symptoms of trauma in residents and avoiding that re-traumatization. Next screen, Pam. So trauma survivors include, and this is not a uh, limited list. There are many, many, and I think most of us can um, reflect on our own lives and think this is what traumatized me. This is what um, I haven't gotten beyond, what I need assistance to get beyond, uh, how I manage my life to survive this trauma that happened. These are things that we think of that immediately come to mind, and it, it's your military veterans, survivors of disaster, natural and human caused, um, survivors of abuse, be it physical, sexual, or mental abuse. You know, those um, types of abuse carry, even in 2023, carry a certain amount of shame on the survivor that shouldn't be there any longer, yet we see it uh, in the social media outlets. Um, we hear it from our friends who have or are experiencing some type of abuse that I don't want to say anything. I shouldn't have done that. I let it happen. And we need to have a culture where people are free to speak um, their life. And we have the means and the ways to support them and helping them lift some of that burden from themselves as a means of um, treating the, the trauma history for them. So again, that goes back to your, I think, I think our social workers are fabulous and they certainly, certainly um, do develop uh, wonderful relationships with our residents and get in there and, and to the extent possible, counsel them. But the importance of your behavioral health professionals being accessible to you, um, we can't stress that enough. And every patient may not want that, but if they do not want that, then that's something you want to make sure at your level that you've documented that effort, that they've had that choice and what their choice was in determining um, if they chose to see a mental health professional. We think of trauma survivors of, of folks with a history of homelessness um, or history of imprisonment and a, tragic, a traumatic loss of a loved one. And I would assert there, it doesn't have to be traumatic. Um, you know, sadly, my father-in-law passed uh, in April of this year. He and my mother-in-law had been married uh, 70 years, actually, 70 years, and uh, his loss was unexpected, um, but it wasn't necessarily traumatic, um, but it's traumatic to his family. It's traumatic to my mother-in-law, and um, because of our parents and their age, we, we kind of split different households on Mother's Day, and I asked my husband, I said, well, how's Catherine doing? And, and you know, she has five children, so she had a blessed day with her five children. But at one point, she broke down and cried. And she told my husband, she said, he's told me 70 years what I do every day. So now every day I wake up and I have to think about what it is I'm going to do. And that was their culturally acceptable way to live their entire life. So although the loss wasn't necessarily a traumatic loss, as we think of accidents or unexpected deaths, it's a loss of 70 years. So, you know, we, we need to open up our hearts and our minds and just look at what what is a loss to one is not necessarily a loss to another, but it, it still pains them. And there's still that grief process that could well go on the remainder of one's lifetime. So Pam, if we could hit the next one. So something to think about, and I think this is really important. Uh, this actually came from Harvard's Business Review, uh, an article that points out that it's much easier to recognize another person's biases uh, than it is to identify your own. 
And this is what they suggest. And I think this is fabulous because um, I don't know a few classes ago, somewhere in my life, I thought I was pretty unbiased about most things. And the more we had to explore that, the more we had to look at ourselves and, and, and really kind of like open your mind to, to um, different ideas, different ways of life. Uh, it really made me see that I was more biased than I imagined I was. And something that is crucial in dealing with trauma-informed care is you cannot be. And that's so much easier said than done. At the end of the day, you may or may not be, but your approach could not be biased and your ears have to be open to your, um, to your person, to their needs, uh, and to others around you and your team. So I thought this was really cool to um, throw in here as recommendations. And I think this would be a, a good team exercise uh, for leadership and centers. When difficult situations come up, you may want to discuss, okay, how are we going to approach this? This is really uncomfortable. Um, and, and I'll go back and my family member um, who, who has a drug addiction issue uh, is approached on so many levels by his own family of, with so many biases. It's almost difficult to have just a calm relationship with him um, or a calm conversation with him because of all the biases in our own family. And it's really important to recognize that when you try to interject yourself into someone's life and have purpose and, and give them comfort in whatever situation they happen to be in. So something to consider is to acknowledge your own biases. So acknowledge that you have biases, then educate yourself to do better. And this comment reminds me of the now we know better, do better. Um, and I think that's a really good motto to live by. Let others challenge your assumptions. It's not an argument. It's a discussion. Um, let that light bulb go off. Have that big epiphany. Uh, let someone else challenge your assumptions. And be open to feedback. And all feedback is good feedback. It's what you do with it. It's how you construct it. It's how you move forward and how, how you perform better. And then embrace the diverse perspectives. And I think for myself and a lot of us, that's really probably the most enjoyable part of acknowledging your biases and working through this process. But as I said earlier, um, we are not in a situation where we can compare one loss, one hurt, one trauma to another's. Um, even if we, we've experienced the same thing ourselves. I'm checking my time, hey, I move on to the next. So how not to re-traumatize. So avoiding re-traumatization equals identifying your triggers. Next, excuse me, I'm losing my voice too. So the plan of care, the facility really needs to collaborate with the survivors and they are survivors. Um, the family, the friends, and other healthcare professionals to obtain a history. We've talked about that. Identify those triggers. Use your team. Talk to your care staff. Talk to the families, the friends, and keep their confidence. You want to make sure that if you're discussing someone's trauma, you're only discussing it with people they want you to discuss it with. Um, my children would be able to tell you nothing about me prior to their birth. I promise you that. So that's not the right person to ask about Cindy and her trauma. So it's also important for the facility staff to understand the cultural preferences of the individual and how that will impact on their delivery of care. Next, Pam. So implement the plan. The triggers need to be communicated clearly to the folks in the facility. And that would be anybody who interacts with that patient. And we talk about um, sights, sounds, the senses, and I, that is so fabulous. But we also need to talk about um, approaches and uh, how we treat people in general goes back to ages and don't talk over people, talk to people. That triggers people. It can make them very angry, as a matter of fact. So <clears throat> who to notify when the residents experience a trigger? Maybe they have that one special nurse that they'll talk to, that they'll participate with, or that one special housekeeper. Care approach a number of caregivers to provide care such as hygiene. And most anyone who suffered a physical trauma, physical trauma, and most of us in general really don't like three people to come in to bathe us. That's just general dignity issue. So really consider these approaches and how many people for anyone, whether it is a behavior um, or hygiene or care, any type of care. 
avoid unnecessary conversation that is not relevant to the resident's care and personal opinions or experiences are not relevant. Do not cry, everyone is unique. They'll share with you what they choose to share with you that you choose to share. Um, and again, it's their personal opinion and it's their experience and therefore it is. So we can go to the next, Kim. These are our resources. Um, I wanna thank Pam for putting this slideshow together actually. Uh, and I tacked on my resources there at the bottom. And um, Susan, I believe that that is the end of our presentation and we hit time right now. All right. Thank you guys. We went right up to the wire. We could have probably done this for another hour to get more information out. Um, I appreciate everyone being here. I appreciate Cindy, Pam, and Dorothy for their wonderful presentations. If you have any questions, feel free to email those to me and we can get those answered. I will send them out to the presenters and they can answer them. I'll get them out to everybody. The recording will be sent out probably next week, along with the slides that were presented here. And um, again, there'll be CEUs available for those as well. When I sign out, the evaluation link will pop up. So please be sure to complete that evaluation for us so we can continue to give you better options and better opportunities as we move forward. Suzanne, do you have anything before we sign off? I do not just want to wish everybody a happy spring and have a good afternoon. Oh, and the June, the June trauma-informed care webinar information will be going out. I did forget something. It will be on cultural competency, and that registration information will likely be coming out uh, the first of next week. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us. Have a good day. Thanks, guys.